I was a pastor for 38 years uh, in California and a little bit of time in Michigan. In rain, I would always freak out with rain like this. Um, but I had a great pastor from Africa, and we just again welcome all the wonderful people watching online from Tanzania and the continent of Africa. I'll actually, two weeks from today, be uh, in, in uh, um, Nairobi, Kenya, speaking at a conference, and so uh, we'll be over with our dear friends. But I had one of my closest friends from Africa. He's a pastor, Pastor Sam Sikapizier. One day I was stressing on a Sunday out in California about the rain and its impact and blah, blah, blah. And he, he stopped me, put his hands on my shoulders and said, Pastor, in Africa, rain means that tomorrow is going to come. He said, rain is a sign of blessing. It means that God is preparing the future. This is a signal today that God is with us. So I just want to kind of flip the mindset today. You stepped out into blessing today, uh, and you got here, and I'm not joking. I know the closer we got to the building here, the stronger the blessing got, because <laughs> we could hardly see uh, the rain, but today is a great, great day. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 8 in just a moment, and I want to preach a message this morning on this 8th anniversary called The Sojourner, and you'll understand in just a moment uh, what I mean by that. My beautiful bride, Karen, is here, love her to death. Since we were here last time, we have increased, what, what's our most current picture right there? So those are our 11 I wanted five. I wanted a basketball team. We had six. I said, Lord, can you give us maybe a baseball team, a nine? We got to 10. I said, we'll go for the football team. And uh, so we have our little 11 littles up there. So it's a joy of our life. There's something about turning 60. And I'm not obsessed with age. Ecclesiastes 5.20 says that the godly person does not often think about the years of their life. For the Lord keeps them preoccupied with the gladness of their heart. You can literally lose track of your age because you're so consumed with God's goodness. Like, man, I just turned 70. Last time I checked, I was 60. But the gladness and the goodness of God has kept me preoccupied. We don't think about the regrets of the past, and we don't think about the brevity of tomorrow. But there is something about 60 and 11 grandkids that you kind of sit back and go, wow, that, that happened wonderfully quick and wonderfully slow. Our four adult children, we have just, we've just skipped right past them now. Uh, for Christmas, they get a, I think the, uh, our kids get a $25 gift certificate to Target uh, uh, because the thousands of dollars have been spent on the 11. I said, kids, from here on, coupon for you. You're, it's all about the grandkids. How many grandma and grandpas know what I'm talking about in this room right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This morning, we're going to get into 2 Kings 8. And before I do, I just want to set your mindset for just a moment for 2023. I know we're about a month into 2023, but I really want us to, to be really equipped and treasured up in our mindset about our life as believers and leaders in the marketplace. I may have mentioned this super quick last time I was here, but I want to refresh your thinking about three things when it comes to this whole idea of a life of meaning and leadership out in the marketplace. And I'm going to tie this into 2 Kings 8. Can you put that first slide up there, if you will? Uh, I want you to know that you cannot hide your heart in 2023. Whatever fills, spills. Can't hide your heart. You can't hide it behind any kind of wall or ideology, whatever fills the human heart spills. It spills in the home, it spills in the marketplace. That's why we have to treasure the word of God strongly and magnificently in our soul because we cannot hide this thing that's inside. You can maybe regulate it for a few moments in a setting, but once that setting loses control and life begins to speed up, whatever's inside the heart, so when you treasure the word, when you treasure the kingdom, when your mind is set on him, we have nothing to worry about even under the hottest pressure because whatever fills, spills. Here's number two going into 2023. Remember that nobody's success is robbing your potential in this room. People have a hard time resourcing their brothers and sisters celebrating because theirs hasn't arrived yet. And their mindset, especially with that Gen Z crowd that's in my, on my campus and those, those millennials that work at the campus, 
it's very hard for them to really, really go all in on their brother or sister's future. They're always reserved and hesitant because they're waiting for theirs to arrive. But you have to understand this. The kingdom of God is not based on scarcity. It's based on abundance. So nobody's success is ripping off your potential. Not everybody arrives at the same time. My kids all got married on different days. All my grandchildren were born on different days. Some people are arriving at the dream today and you're gonna arrive next week or next year. You've already arrived at a spot that somebody else wants to get to. Nobody's success is robbing your potential, so you gotta set yourself free with this. Imagine there being two little sailboats in the harbor, let's say, of San Francisco by the Golden Gate where it's very windy. Imagine one little sailboat is sitting there bobbing up and down, going nowhere. Imagine the next little sailboat blasts by that sailboat at full speed. Imagine the little boat bobbing up and down, looking at the other boat and yelling at that boat and saying, hey, stop stealing my wind. That other boat would probably say, put your sail up, dummy. There's plenty of wind in the harbor to sail more than one ship. And on the day of Pentecost, when that rushing mighty wind helped birth the church, not just fire, but wind, there's plenty of kingdom gale force to flourish every dream, every family, every leader, every church. Nobody's success is robbing your potential. So bless those that are nearby. Let go of the anxiety. Nobody's success is robbing your potential in the kingdom. Last one is this, real fast. In 2023, if you think for too long about a missed opportunity, chances are you will miss the next one too. Now watch this. This is very simple, but very, very significant. Um, We oftentimes, when we go through a failure, a miss, we drop our head. Our heart follows. We're looking down. If you think for too long in that posture, chances are, Three more opportunities just came by, but you missed them because you're thinking for too long about a missed opportunity, okay? Now watch this. How many of you have ever crashed your car? You totaled your car. You've totaled your car. You weren't totaled, but the car was totaled. You get the phone call from Floyd's auto body, and they tell you to come down to the yard. They let you behind the chain link fence, and you go up to your car. Why are you there? You're only there for one reason. It's to reach inside the wreckage and pull out your valuables. You're not there to tie the wreck around your ankle so you can drag the wreckage around for the rest of your life. Here's how this works. When you have a miss, a mistake, a failure, a sin, a setback, the whole idea of the kingdom is that you've got to reach inside the wreckage to pull out the wisdom, but you have to leave the wreckage behind. Because if you think for too long about missed opportunities, yeah, don't blow them off. You've got to pull the wisdom out of the wreckage, but you've got to turn your back on the wreckage, and you've got to move forward, and you've got to look up, friends. Don't think for too long. I want to give you your nerd word for today. I'm a college president, so I'm going to give you a nerd word. Here we go. Next, next slide, if you will. Magis is one of the greatest words to get into your vocabulary, into your thinking. It's not a Bible word, but it contains powerful kingdom principles. Magis is a Latin word that means better or greater than before. Not better than you but better than I was before, not better than you. So I'm not trying to close the gap in 2023 between you and me because God sovereignly allows and releases outcomes in different stages. What I'm closing the gap is between who I am right now and the potential on the inside for who I can become. I'm closing the gap inside myself between who I am currently and the potential for who I can become. I'm not closing the gap between you and me because when I compare myself to you, I will always lose my way. Magis is a profound word. It means that I am better than before. It doesn't mean that I'm better than you. 
So let it go and just simply focus on maturity, growth, your connection groups, your growth track. All of it is closing the gap inside your own soul, not closing the gap between us. Magis, magis, magis. Here's the second idea I want to put into your heart in 2023. Then we're going to read 2 Kings 8. Here we go. I want to plant a powerful concept in Hope City today about what our world needs, both biblically and socially in our world today, is this concept of what is called moral imagination. Now, this term was birthed during the French Revolution by an Englishman. Moral imagination. I have found it one of the most powerful guideposts for my life to think about my life as a as a powerful believer. Remember, the devil wants to take powerful Christians and turn them into average churchgoers. But the Holy Spirit wants to take an average churchgoer and turn them into a powerful Christian. So in 2023, you're going in one of those two directions. In a presence-driven church, I got to believe he's lifting average people into powerhouses for his kingdom. But here is the deal. Moral imagination no, if you could put that slide up, if you will. The most important kingdom trait in troubled times is moral imagination. We must develop Christians who will risk and stay embodied in the immorality, and I use that as an academic term for crisis. We must develop powerful Christians who will risk and stay embodied in the crisis or the immorality of society because people are in need of care. While at the same time, next slide, while at the same time mentally repositioning themselves outside the crisis to architect a future design that is moral and redemptive. So here's the idea. As powerful Christians in 2023, we put ourselves in the heart of the crisis of this society because that's where people are bleeding. That's where people are hurting. So moral imagination is I'm not going to lift myself or remove myself from the pain of the problems and the street traumas that are consuming this nation. As a believer, I'm going to stay right where the people are bleeding. But I also can't just live there or I'll be subsumed by the pain and lose my own way. The Holy Spirit helps us be in the pain, but also to reposition ourselves outside the pain so that we can architect a more moral and redemptive way for our neighborhoods and our cities. Moral imagination is a powerful idea for neighborhoods to nations. So stay in it. Stay right where the people are hurting, right where they're bleeding. Don't move up to the high rent district and just simply say from this tower I'm going to theorize about pain but also don't just drink the pain and breathe the pain 24-7 you'll become so angry hopeless the Holy Spirit helps us get up into that third heaven helps us get outside it look upon it and use our gifts and talents and vision to architect hope and architect a redemptive way so that future generations don't have to live in that bloodshed. Can somebody say amen in this room? All righty, let's, uh, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 8. Here we go. The Bible says that now Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, now, in 2 Kings chapter 4, there's a profound story. Let's just pause right there. He's talking to the woman that back in chapter 4, he had restored to life. You might remember this story. Just let me story tell just for a few seconds. Elisha is an itinerant prophet. He has an armor bearer named Gehazi. As they traveled the countryside, there was hospitality bestowed on them from this Shunammite woman. She's the first one that ever developed a green room or a ready room. She's the first one that ever invented hospitality, a gift basket. She's the first one that ever built lodging for the prophet to rest. First one to do it. So Elisha has a place of refuge in the Shunammite woman's house, in her husband's house. She's a good woman who was caring and had a life of means. One day, Elisha, back in chapter 4, comes down for breakfast with his coffee, 
leans in the doorway and asks through Gehazi what the woman's needs are. And she says, we're well taken care of, man. We don't need any cash. I'm well taken care of. But then Elisha realizes that she's barren. And one of God's favorite things was to give barren women their first child, especially if they were older. So Elisha, feeling very prophetic, says by this time next year, and names the gender, you're going to have a son. And she says, no, my Lord. Why would she say no? Because she'd already reconciled her broken heart. She had a box in the attic with all this shattered glass. We all have it. We all have it. Something that God has done for everybody else, but he's not done it for me. A dream that did not come true. We have this box up there and it's taped and marked. It's sitting there. And Elisha goes right into the attic, tears open this box and starts dancing on the broken glass of the broken heart. And she says, no, my Lord, I love God. I don't understand, but I'm cool with it. Everybody else seemed to get that prayer answered. I didn't get an answer. So it didn't cost me my faith. I'm still a generous person. But don't go in that spot with me. Because you'd think she would say, woohoo, I'm going to have a baby. No, my Lord. Because she had set aside that broken dream that simply is never coming true in my life. And he goes right there. Lo and behold, she's pregnant, has a son. Son grows up a little bit, not old enough to spend a day away from mama, but old enough to run out to see papa in the fields. Bible says he ran out in the fields in chapter four of 2 Kings. It's this woman. He cries out in my head, my head. We don't know if it's an aneurysm. We don't know what it was, but he falls dead. And the Bible says he died. And they placed her on the mother's lap. She then went and took the dead boy and put him in Elisha's uh, room and put him in his bed. And then she goes out to the field and she says, did I not tell you? No. You think I just want to get pregnant, cut the umbilical nurse? I wanted to raise a man and a warrior. I just didn't want to be pregnant and have a baby. It would have been better never to have gone down this road with some kind of partial little miracle to have it destroyed. Why does God have the power to start stuff but not the power to complete it? She represents millions of people in this country. God started something and it seems like the devil took over. So Elisha has a crisis of his own faith. He goes into the room and one of the weirdest scenes in the Bible, Bible says he gets down on the kid I got to be careful here. And so gets down on the kid, lays on him, torso to torso, arm to arm, eye to eye, prays. By the way, if you want to know how old somebody is, very simple test. Just say, I want you to get on the floor and get up as fast as possible. I can guess how old you are at that point in time. We came to Houston. We brought our little granddaughter Gemma and introduce her to Twister. We didn't think this through <laughs> because after her and Elias played it for an hour, they turned to us and said, Grandma, Grandpa, play Twister with us. I, know, I don't think we can do yellow. Over here. <laughs> the Bible says that Elisha laid on the kid and it says he grew warm. Grew warm. He jumps up and he goes to leave the room. The Bible says in chapter four, he paces back and forth, puts his hand on the doorknob. We have a miracle. And he looks back and says, seriously, is this all we get? All we get as a church is to turn the corpse into a coma. Is that all we get? Is that the power of the church, power of God? We simply turn death into a coma. So he lays down a second time, prays a second time. Now he sneezes. Friends. His eyes open, and we have resurrection. Now Gehazi had gone to pray over the kid, first of all, with Elisha's staff. It says nothing happened. That's like a lot of churches in America, going through the motion, but nothing ever really happens. Then Elisha went, 
prayed. He grew warm. He could have left the room and called it a miracle. But something inside said, there has to be more than this. Plays a second time and the kid awakens. That level three faith that says, I'm going to lay, stay, and pray until the city shakes. I'm not just simply going to turn a corpse into a coma. And just because we have a little pulse, a little warmth next to a dead church down the street, we're going to call it a day. And we certainly aren't just going to go through the motions like Gehazi and touch him with the staff and say, and nothing happened, but I was faithful. So he awakens. Put that verse back up. Here we go. Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life. He's talking to her. Arise and depart with your household and sojourn wherever you can. For the Lord has called for a famine and it will come upon the land for seven years. So the woman arose and did according to the word of the, of the man of God. She went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines, the enemy, for seven years. Now let's frame this. You're so close to God that he raised your kid from the dead. But now, later on in life, the word from the Lord is, hey, I want you to go sojourn wherever you could sojourn. What kind of word is that? (laughs) Go wander is what the word means. I need you to go spend seven years, uh, just go figure it out. Go, I don't know, just go. I understand this as a parent, we had our four kids in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where the Groves and I first became dear friends. And we'd give them 20 bucks at the beginning of the day, drop them off at the Rivertown Mall, and say, here's enough money for the food court. Go to a good PG-13 movie. Bring me the receipt. I want to see what you saw. We'll pick you up at 11 o'clock tonight. We'll drop you off at 9. You go sojourn wherever you can sojourn. I need some space. So our kids will go sojourn wherever. I don't care what they did. They're sojourning. (laughs) She returns after seven years. Here's my question to the woman. What have you been doing? Seven years? You were 41, now you're 48? These are prime years of your adult life. And you've spent a major chapter of your adult life sojourning wherever you could sojourn? What kind of word from the Lord is that? How do you go from being someone to whom God prophetically gives you a child and raises it from the dead to wandering around for seven years, buying time? There's millions of people who've been sojourning in this country. You were 36. Had life by the tail, vision. Cancer hit. The treatments. The sudden detour of life and now you're 51. You're cancer free. But you look back and you go, man, I've just spent the last 14 years and I got nothing to show for it. People that got married in their 20s. The person that they were committed to was not committed to them. They were spun off course into this endless corn maze of legal jostling and children and money and bankruptcy. Now they're 42. Just stabilizing like but I, I've spent the last 13 years of my life sojourning wherever I could sojourn. I got nothing to show. Everybody around me is progressing and gathering and keeping and preserving. I've been a sojourner. Started a business. It was my idea. I had these partners. They aced me out. They took my idea. They're making money. I've been left out of the equation. It's cost me 12 years of my adult life. I've just been sojourning. Wherever I could sojourn. Lady, what have you been doing for seven years? How do you maintain your psyche, your sanity, your spiritual focus 
when you've been sojourning wherever you can sojourn. And she lost seven magnificent years of her adult life. Where's God at? How could God be with me? He raised my kid from the dead. And he tells me to go wander around for seven years. Plays with your mind. Plays with your theology. So I just want you to know, first of all, put that slide up. The end of the seven years, she returned from the land of the Philistines. She went to, to appeal to the king for a house in her land. I want everybody in this room to know, first of all, that nobody in this room gets to live a linear life. What do you mean by that? Nobody in this room gets to go from point A to point B in a straight line. There's not a leader. There's not a believer. There's not an established person with a good reputation. You saw my little highlights. You saw my grandkids. I'm a president of a university. All you see these snippets. You have filled in all the blanks. And so you think that I have just gone on some linear straight line from this to that in a nice straight formation to reach this stage of life at 60. Don't let the devil lie to you. Nobody in this room gets to live a linear life. Israel didn't travel a linear way in the wanderings. Jesus didn't walk in a linear way. And, 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 the, and the early church in Paul didn't go. If you put those maps on a screen, it would look like a tangled ball of yarn up here. Nobody goes in a straight line. Nobody. Every single one of us spends a season or two as a sojourner. When there's a segment of our life, professionally and personally, which we cannot explain, where it feels like we're on our own, where it feels like the prayers are not being answered, we're sojourning wherever we can sojourn. Everybody else appears to be going from here to there, and I'm just crazy doing this, controlled by court documents, controlled by doctor's appointments, controlled by abandonment. I've lost control of my path. I'm sojourning wherever I can sojourn. Now let's read this quick. Here we go. Now the king was talking with Gehazi. Remember, this is the associate of Elisha. This is Jeho Jehoram, the king. And he has a profound curiosity. With Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, hey, tell me some great stories. Tell me all about the great things that Elisha has done. The king was generally curious. I want to know some behind-the-scenes stuff about Elisha. So, next slide. So while Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, this boy, now let's frame this, it's been seven, at least seven years, probably 11 years. What God did in her life is still the most powerful story in Israel. So how do you go from being a participant in the most powerful story in Israel Sojourning wherever you can sojourn. Returning after seven years with nothing to show for it. People go, man, I was 30, now I'm 40. I got less money, smaller network, worse credit score, terrible health, more enemies. I just lost 10 years in the center of my adult life and I got nothing to show for this. So she returns to the king. She walks in on her own story. You want to talk about a, a certain level of crazy when you, when you read the Bible? You've been gone for seven years. And you walk into the king. And behold... The woman whose son he had raised, restored to life and appealed to the king for her house and her land. And Gehazi said, my Lord, oh king, here's the woman. 
I'm talking about her and she just walked in the door? Go figure. Everything in this book is a type and a model and a shadow. I just want you to know that when you love the Lord and you're sent out in a sojourning season, seven years, 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, I don't know how long the sojourning season is. You're out there, not building anything, not, not gathering. You bring nothing back to the party. You think you've been forgotten. You think you've been lost. I just want you to know that your tears and your story have never left the throne room of God. Your story is right before the Lord. My Lord, my King, here she is. And here's her son whom Elisha restored to life. This is crazy. Why is she back? When you've been sojourning wherever you can sojourn, and you've lost not a season, but I'm talking about years of adult productivity. All you want is a do-over. Hey, I'm still breathing after seven years. Hey, King, can I have my dirt back? Can I get my property back? I don't care what the condition is. I'm sure it's a tattered, abandoned farmhouse now, broken shingles, door off. I'm certain that there's weeds and barrenness and nothing's been cultivated, watered. But you know what? Can I just have a do-over? Can I just please get my dirt back? She appeals to the king. This first changed my life. I'm not hyping or overstating this. I never saw this. I've read it, but I never saw it until about two years ago. I preached this for William McDowell, for the Wilkerson's in Miami. And I said, Dan, I think I want to share this at Hope City about the eighth year. It says, when the king asked the woman, she told him, it's all true. Can I just get my stuff, my dirt? I just want to do over. And I used to think I understood that restoration was a second chance. But I found out that our creator and our father doesn't just give us a second chance. Now watch this. He appointed an official for her saying, restore all that was hers together with all the produce of the fields from the day she left until the land, until now. She doesn't get the field, she gets the yield. I do not know how God does this. But while we're wandering and sojourning, when we're out there and we, we, we go through the wandering and the sojourning of cancer and we were healthy at 32 and suddenly something showed up on the doctor's report and it spun me into a decade of just surviving with health. My world got small. People who've sojourned through the pain of divorce, they were all in and they were hurt and abandoned. It threw them into a legal warfare and child custody hearings and they've just been sojourning through a decade of this stuff. They had a business and a partner stole from you and you've been sojourning wherever you've been sojourning. They're making all the money, getting all the opportunity, getting all the credit, and it was your idea. Maybe you had a vision for ministry. You had a dream for a church. People believed in you and invested in you, and, but the conditions of this world or COVID or some craziness obliterated that and you just find yourself sojourning wherever you could sojourn and you return with nothing in your hand to the king who's holding your story right before the throne who's most curious about you he hears this and he decrees to the official that whoever 
took over that land and that property wrongfully that belongs to this woman who's ever been cultivating that field and developing that field, whatever produce has been put in the barns, not only, woman, do you get back the field that is rightfully yours, you're getting back seven years of productivity that you never thought was happening. Because church, when you love the Lord, there are no lost years. There's no lost years when you love the Lord. You may sojourn, you may wander, you may not understand. You may lose some critical years of productivity, but when you love the Lord through it, you stay generous. You stay connected to your church. You stay in your small group. You have no other understanding of all this other life garbage going on outside this meeting. You're just sojourning wherever you can sojourn. When you return and when the king sees fit, and I don't know how he does it. I don't know if it takes seven years, 10 years, three years. I don't know how he does it. But if you love the Lord as a sojourner, a moment is going to come in which he will deliver the yield of those lost years. I have a son. And I close here. I've raised three millennials. They're all in their 30s. My third born son had difficulty finding love in his life. And he, he found finally after his siblings were married and he said, dad, I'm 27. He said, it's not working for me. She ain't out there. I'm alone. No one wants me. But when you hear that as a parent, you just kind of make up some words because you hurt. His siblings were married and having kids and he didn't even have a date. And one day, I see his computer because he was finishing a second master's degree, very smart kid, division one football player. And I see this picture of the White House and then I see a picture of him. Uh, no, a girl. I said, honey, who's this girl? She goes, that's the White House. I said, no, honey, that's a picture of a girl with the White House in the background. That's not a picture of the White House with a girl in front. He says, oh, dad, he goes, I met this girl and I didn't want to tell you because, you know, she's, she has a past. And I, I, I said, well, son, why do you think they call us pastors? <laughs> he goes, really? I said, yeah, really. They fell in love and they stood there on the state steps of the state capitol in California and this girl he goes she has a pass because she's a single mom twice and I'll never forget on that day when those two boys were gathered around Kramer's legs when he felt he was sojourning for several years that life was passing him by and he had no idea that there was a field with two little boys Zach and Eli that were being prepared for him And on that day, the Lord gave him his field, but also his yield as a father. I would like us across this room to stand. Pastor Dan is going to come in just a moment. Thank you for your graciousness. How many are glad you came to the house of the Lord today? Say, Pastor Scott, that put language to my life. I feel like everybody's had a straight line and I've been in turmoil, chaos and pointed in all these reckless directions, not of my choosing. I've been a soldier and I've lost some key years of my adult life and it has brought despair to me. But today the word of God is broken through and I see hope for the sojourner. I don't know how he'll deliver it to you, but your life is inside that throne, the throne of God. And he is putting produce and productivity that you don't see.
But here's the key. You have to love the Lord. If you love the Lord, there's no lost years. And that moment of field and yield is going to come. How many say, President, Pastor Scott, I feel like a sojourner that God is rescuing today. Can you put a hand up high across this building? I've gone through, look at this, Jesus, almighty God. Father, we lift up our prayers, Lord, right now, Jesus. First of all, for the sojourners in this room that have been beat up and this is built up in their life, we pray, God, your grace and your strength. Father, I pray that they would find their way back into the King's presence. And Lord, you're gonna give them more than a second chance, God. You've been producing in them and forming in them a faith that is like gold, making them a powerful Christian in 2023. God, give strength to the sojourner today. We ask these things today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Pastor Dan is going to come and he's going to ask a very important question. Pastor Dan, you can... Take it and ask for those to find Christ today. God bless you. Carry this word. Forget the preacher. Don't forget the word. God bless you, guys. Come on. Can we give it up for Dr. Hagen? I can't honestly think of a more perfectly fitted word for our anniversary weekend. Would you do me a favor? If you're watching online in the room, would you close your eyes for just a moment? If you're here today and you would say, Dan Daniel, Jackie, that message was for me, but what it did in the wandering is it made me realize more than ever my need for a savior. The reason we do all of this is because we're, as a church, aligning under the mighty hand of God to introduce people to hope, to freedom, to joy, to everything that they've been filling the voids and self-medicating with busyness and all the things in life, the answer begins with and ends with Jesus. If you're watching online, if you're in the room and you would say, Daniel, Jackie, today, I wanna commit my life to Jesus for the very first time, or maybe you're here and you've been wandering, but that wandering has gotten you caught up in the prodigal life. And you would say, this weekend, this sermon, it's caused me in my heart, it's convinced me of the fact that there's more to life, there's more to life than just wandering. And I wanna come back and I wanna rededicate my life to Jesus. I'm gonna to count to three and we won't embarrass you, but we're gonna pray according to Romans 10, verse nine and 10 that says, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you in the room at West Houston. One, I wanna give my life to Jesus for the first time. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, would you lift up your hand? We're looking all over. I see you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Man, more hands than I can count are going up. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Wow. You can put your hands down. This is what we're gonna do as a family. We're gonna pray. Even if you didn't lift up your hand, God saw your heart more than even the hand that was counted. Say this out loud with me. Say, Jesus, I've been wandering. And the truth is, today, I position my life, my heart, I position every area of my life in alignment with you. Jesus, thank you for hanging on the cross for my life even though I didn't deserve it. I repent for every sin, all my struggles, all the areas of my life that I've been running away from you. I ask for your forgiveness. And from this moment on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, let's give God praise. Come on.